back and if I put my headphones on then that cancels that shit out so sorry about that and we'll get back and we're going to have some fun and this is going to be the probably the inappropriate part of the broadcast today so if you don't like swears uh, you should probably move any women and children out of the thing for you so uh, we were talking about Brian and how he was terrorizing a friend of ours named Jan Vrotsos and we were trying to get him to take this post down that had gotten shared like 12,000 times. I think it was more than that, Louie. I think it was over 30,000. Uh, it could have been like down the... Uh, well, there, it wasn't just... That's 12,000 times on Facebook, but then there, you also had the numerous blog sites, uh, patdollar.com, right, right, right. all those other ones. Yeah. Uh, Pat Dollard's another first-class shitbag. And who, who is that... Uh, what's that roughing... Uh, Jeff... Rainforth, 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 the ref next. Yeah. He's the Rainforth ref. Yeah, He's, yeah. He, go ahead. He uh, lived in a chicken poop coop. Uh, <laughs> he, was, he, was, he was homeless, living in a chicken coop. Uh, used to do <laughs> math. Then I think he ran for some local political office in somewhere in California under like the uh, uh, ticket of like I think he wanted to like ban. Uh, he's basically like a, a raging anti-Semite white nationalist. Pat Dollard, a whole lot more. Pat Dollard. Yeah, Jeff he was Rainforth the definite Nazi. To, oh, well, he yeah he Jeff Rainforth hopped over to Kofage's thing after Pat Dollard made these like tweets calling for like the extermination of like Jews or Muslims or some other all kinds of crazy shit. And um, so they when when Pat Rainforth some kind of before. big shot when when Pat some kind of big shot in like Hollywood or something like Steve Bannon. Uh, he was like one of those sort of like um, failed something or another. You know, kind of. Uh, I, I want to say he was some kind of a background something. Um, like I don't think he was an actor or anything. But then he, after nine eleven, or after we started uh, the Iraq War, he like did some documentary that got him a little bit of uh, notoriety, like very early on. But then he really didn't do much after that. He just started like a website or a blog or something, and um, you know never achieved that that height again. And it was still relatively indie what he did. But yeah, definitely one of those failed artists, you know, that, yeah. that uh, seemed to gravitate towards like the far right. And um, Brian took up, and after Brian's page got big enough, he started writing the Freedom Daily. Which is a was chock a block full of uh, never ending bullshit about how Barack Obama was a Muslim, he was gay, Michelle was a lesbian, uh, everything. Uh, M Michelle was a monkey. Any kind of racist trope, and boy, did they hate Muslims. It didn't matter what kind of Muslim you were. They, you were coming. You were a terrorist, and Trump was his favorite boy. Well, you know, the other thing, though, is that uh, well before, like, Freedom Daily, I mean, see, I got a thing I never wrote. It's a whole, I got a, a, a big old um, folder full of, like, um, racist posts and stuff he made, um, you know, and where he's openly, in, like, endorsing actual, like, I mean, you know, Muslims are Semites, but these, some of the people, are, I should say Semites as well. But no, he was actually promoting some people who were actual like anti-Jewish types, and um, yeah, George started, George Soros is is and uh, the Rothschild control all the banks, and that they've got ten trillion dollars or all that kind of shit. Well, there was the also, globalist. So he had, yeah, yeah, and he so you get he started off like BrianCovage.com, which turned out to be a blog that just plagiarized other people's posts. So but that got shut down real quick when um, news. Um, like, you know, journalists, like TV journalists and stuff who had written op-eds or articles were um, uh, tipped off that he was using their work and just slapping his name on it. So his pay, his first attempt went down real fast. Then there was WoundedAmericanWarrior.com. That kind of went down as well, but under the same URL popped back up again as Freedom Daily. But if you ever were to look at Freedom Daily, the actual URL was still Wounded American Warrior. And... Uh, and that kind of like, uh, well, and they were also gaming the system at that point, buying uh, Facebook pages and using it to promote um, mm -hmm. the, the, the website and everything. 
and um, of course they were definitely tapping into the whole like um, uh, clickbait type stuff and they also had a lot of satellite blogs and stuff that were assisting because they were kind of like writing his coattails yeah and, Joe uh, the Joe the plumber was one of that Joe Joe for America shit I think he yeah. did he run for Congress or something I don't even remember uh, probably I I actually he was actually working at a cheap plant with me he was in the other building but <laughs> really yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, he got a job in Toledo, did, Ohio. Did you not go over and punch him in the face at least once? Oh, I. I Joe Wesselback, was... whatever his name was, fucking idiot. Yeah, and he wrote about it, saying like they tried to force me to join the union, and they, you literally, you nobody's ever been forced to join a union since like 1948, I want to say. Yeah. Um, and uh, like. Like you, you, you can work there, but like you don't have to like join the union. And he was trying to make it sound like they were trying to press. It's like nobody even knows whether you join or not to. It's not advertised. It's not public. So I already knew he was lying just because you know personal experience and everything. But um, uh, he's a yeah, Republican. And just to jump, <laughs> they can't just to tell jump, the truth. Well, just to jump forward too, uh, Freedom Daily wound up going down uh, due to Jeff Rainforth using the same exact tactics that they did to go after Jan Brozos, where they wrongfully accused and named somebody and docked somebody. And ironically, the, I don't even know if this is ironic, more like coincidentally, um, one of my friends who was in the Air Force hit me up and said, hey, your name's on the news. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? And it turned out the people that, uh, they wrote a story claiming that this father and son were the actual drivers of the vehicle that ran over the Charlottesville protester. And, um, Oh, I remember so happens, that. I remember. Yeah. And it just so happens they were from Michigan and that their next door neighbor was my friend who was in the air force who like grew up next door to them. And, mm. uh, and so he knew about it going on. And then they, of course they had, um, the uh, news covered the story after they were dealing with uh, all the, the, the flag, all the people coming after them and, and messaging them and calling them. And uh, because I was spent eight hours like defending these people, like mm -hmm. like saying, nope, this is wrong, this is wrong, because I, I knew what was, I didn't even realize Freedom Daily was behind it because there was numerous um, uh, people that did that. Who was that one a guy that, uh, what was his name? Fat redhead guy, Ch Chuck? Uh, oh, uh... And you had some dealings with him or yeah i know who you're talking about what is that fucker's name charles johnson charles c johnson yep yep Char charles c johnson was one of the people named in the lawsuit by that family along with free uh, freedom daily and um uh and so my name popped up on the news because they had pictures of my facebook profile defending them and um so it's just like a weird coincidence that the person they happen to pick on just happens to be someone in my state once again that's like that I happen to know or whatever, and um, uh, and uh, once I now we knew who ran Freedom Daily, but um, they had a and Lindsay uh, who used to work for Freedom Daily actually you know she's got the emails and everything where Colfage would brag about how they had an LLC a Nevada LLC specifically in the state of Nevada because it would protect um, uh, the owner the, the actual owners of like that LLC. And um, but and there's no taxes. Like, there's no taxes in Nevada. Oh, okay. Yeah. And um, uh, I know I know in the emails that because uh, she put forth like a whole uh, doc, you know, for like journalists and stuff. He was like specifically talking about how he didn't want anyone to know, you know, that he runs a site and everything. And now, granted, this all came out years after the fact. But um, uh, I went ahead and like I, I think you did too, or. I, I couldn't have been the only one who messaged the lawyers for the, this family. There, it was like a father and son. Their last name was like Vangaloo or something, Vangalo U or something like that. Mm. And um, uh, and I just kind of like you know messaged them and said like, hey, this is the actual owner. Here's the proof because because it used to be called Freedom Daily with Brian Goldfage, and then he dropped his name from it for basically PR reasons. I have an email from Brian himself saying that the reason he dropped his name from it was because Gary Sinise specifically told him to because he was getting that free house from him. Yeah, Brian and, got a free uh, house from Gary Sinise, fam. So uh, we tried to do whatever we could to convince Gary not to give that shit bag a house because he's nothing but a stochastic terrorist. But um, Well, and he, and he obviously knew that, and that's why he told Brian, get your name off that page. Like, you know... 
basically work in the shadows. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, but yeah, uh, not long after the lawyers were notified and everything, um, that's when I remember the day where we were just like all clicking on the link and it's just like this website's gone. Yeah, that was it. Like this website that was just had so many people visiting it. It was rated like the like most popular and also most untruthful by like Snopes and, and BuzzFeed and all these different like because a lot of the fake news stuff was coming out at the time. And um, uh, and boom, it just disappeared like that. Like, which I thought was pretty amazing. There was no damage control. It was, yeah, it was as if cause he was, said, he was, that was a cash cow to him, but he wasn't making, mm -hmm. I don't guess he's making a hundred grand off of it or whatever, whatever yeah, he put, yeah. whatever Gary Sinise was paying for that house. Hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's also issues, uh, that have never been discussed where, do you remember how he was getting Super Bowl tickets and perks from the, uh, Wounded Warrior Project? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, articles praising them for like the blaze and stuff and the whole thing with Gary Sinise is like he has had an affiliation with him for years prior through the Wounded Warrior Project so for the Sinise Foundation to just go and pick Brian Kofage as someone worthy of his charities um, you know to to build this house for these this you know married couple that has more than enough money um, it's literally it's like a conflict of interest just like the Wounded Warrior Project it was a conflict of interest to award him with these like perks and stuff for, for good press and these are things that like nobody really because that's no one's really covered it you know like I have all this shit you know like <laughs> like all the, the evidence of it but it's just one of those things where it's like it never really came out along with a lot of the racism for instance like I, I actually have proof of this of um uh, a couple examples where when Freedom Daily, because they would love these stories about uh, somebody, you know, a, a CPL user or somebody in their home using a gun for, for defense. And uh, but what he would do is he would take the story and then he would change the uh, offender to a black person. He would find yeah. a stock image of like a black guy. I remember guy that. Like I remember orange. that. And, and yeah, one of the stories was actually, again, coincidentally, it was literally from like a couple miles from my Michigan home. Uh, where it was like um, uh, some, you know, white kid, teenager that was actually lived next door, tried to break into his neighbor's house and had been shot. And he went and used his pictures. He, and he was use the term thug, you know, in all capital letters, because everyone, you know, you know, that's the code word. And, that's the code and word for like, the blackens. And, you know, when you get somebody who is referring to Barack Obama as a, um, a half breed or yeah, Monkey. when they use a lot of coded, yeah, when they use yeah. a lot of coded language and stuff, there's always going to be that wiggle room where people are going to be like PC police, or they're going to, or, or set, it's just satire, or whatever. But when you make an effort to change the race of like people in your stories, like always to black, I mean that's mm -hmm. that the intent and the motivation behind that is is is, is I mean that's even stronger than just well, he knew, using coded. He knew his audience. He knew they were that the right wingers were bunch of racist bigots and uh, Islamophobes so whenever he could gin up a story and he was making I don't know how much money he was making but judging by the clicks I'm saying he was making tens of thousands of bucks a month doing absolutely yep. nothing uh, just telling his dumb shit uh, people to uh, well it's and it's it's funny that even his own writers and like Lindsay's one of them and this isn't something that Lindsay was just saying this is something that was proven in emails she screen capped and preserved where she was arguing with him like you're fucking you're making my story look worse than it is you're using photoshopped images uh, like what I'm writing about isn't even what you titled it like you know so you know it, you can you can tell that they're putting work into it, it really drags her it was you know She's ending up on Snopes all the time, based based on the title and the photo that she didn't even have any control. Yeah, over. I mean, he he is a first class uh, propagandist. I mean, he Goebbels didn't have shit on Colfage. Uh, another person I uh, uh, compared him to back in like the, literally the 2013, late, late end of 2013, like very in the beginning. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, there's been a lot of like. See, and I always argued that that if if now when it came to the journalists, they didn't get involved until like the end of 2018, beginning of 2019. Mm -hmm. Like they ignored us for uh, what would that be like five years, five and a half years? Uh, when he sued me in June of 2014, and three different 
actually it was four different news stations. One of them was, and I don't even know, this makes me wonder about it. There was one, you know, you had the three in Arizona news stations that ran the story when him and his lawyer, Logan Elia, were doing their little um, PR tour. But suddenly, Logan Elia, station, I just need to say, is a bottom feeding piece of shit who should be disbarred for filing uh, frivolous lawsuits. And uh, he is a first class uh, dipshit, and I pray uh, that that scumbag tries to sue me for defamation. Uh, he, well, he I dare agree. you, Logan. You know, I call him every year to brag. You mean to, but, to salt uh, the wounds? To salt the wounds? I just always I think. say, like, hey, hey, uh, remember when a factory worker beat you <laughs> in court? Because <laughs> I was representing myself. <laughs> <laughs> and then at one point, at one point, weren't they trying to say that you were. Uh, that you they wanted to they were going to file charges because i kept referring to you as my attorney and <laughs> they were saying yeah, that you were practicing law without a license, <laughs> license. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my attorney um, <laughs> uh, i kept trying to get them motherfuckers to uh to sue me but they wouldn't i guess they was a little afraid of papa bear or something but uh <laughs> I would have loved to see my dad go to work on on Logan. That would have been fucking comic gold, I tell you. Yeah, he uh I, I still can dig up all those emails where I was really I was cornering him on how he didn't do his due diligence and providing like examples and stuff like that. But I really I have to wonder, did they really expect to go to court? Because I remember you saying there's no. no I mean that that's that that's part of the grift. I mean that's why Brian loves Logan so much because he's also a grifter. He's not a trial attorney. He knew damn good and well that when he sued you, Prager, Darren, and uh, Justine, that uh, was there anybody else? I don't remember. But oh, uh, when he uh, sued them, uh, yeah. Ken. Oh yeah, Ken. Did he sue Ken? I don't. I don't remember. Yeah. Yeah. But. Uh, Everybody, Brian sued uh, all the people that came to defend uh, Jan, who just happened to have uh, homeowners insurance policies. And the reason why you do that is, is because you have, in every homeowners policy, you have a clause that defends you, I think, against defamation or something like that. And it's a requirement that the states have. And you have to uh, have like $25,000. Uh, you have $25,000 in insurance. So this piece of shit, Logan Aaliyah, uh, filed uh, uh, this frivolous lawsuit against uh, my friends, and it was all, it was complete horseshit, but he knew, he knew how the insurance uh, companies work. He knew that he could file, file these lawsuits, and then uh, that the insurance companies would settle these cases because it's more expensive to try the cases than it is to defend them. Yeah. So he yeah. and Brian Colfage won. I don't know how much. I know he got like twenty five thousand dollars ahead. I don't know how many people. No, no. I know he, Dar- he only got. He only got um, since Darren Remington didn't take the. What they really wanted was NDAs because what they wanted us to do is to stop bringing up all this shit happening because it was definitely a uh, revamping of his like image and mm-hmm. there was too much dirt and too much of us talking and I think it was like. Like they, with the way the lawsuit reads too, it reads like I'm some sort of like mastermind, and Justine and all these people were my, my minions, you know, doing my bidding and everything. And um, uh, but we were telling lies like, against Brian Colfage. He, he was we hurting his feelings. It was terrible. So he had to file a lawsuit and then start a GoFundMe for his legal defenses. Yeah. So he got the yeah, money yeah, from those legal defenses, and then he got Logan well, and Leah to work on a contingency fee because he's a wounded warrior, and he wanted to have, you know, a good client that could get him some more clients, see? Yeah, it was all a grift. There, there's, there's all a lot of weird shit about that because one minute Logan wasn't charging a penny. When he created a GoFundMe to raise money for his legal uh, fees, uh, he claimed, uh, help me, the way the GoFundMe was, it was already fraudulent. It's one of the one of the fraudulent GoFundMe's I list on my thing because it says, help me go after liberals who threaten the life of to of my wife and baby. 
yeah. entirely totally untrue verified by his own police report you know when i called them and asked them for any records and which i have the audio of that in my article um uh, and so right off the bat, he's he's continuing this like uh, uh, defamation of, of us and or just in general because he's, you know, he's attaching all these things that never happened. If you looked at the lawsuit itself, that's never no one it's never listed once in there and about any of the defendants us ever uh, threatening his wife or baby. But yet the GoFundMe to raise this, this money was and it, and the I want to say the GoFundMe only raised something like. Uh, you got to keep in mind that this early on in the summer or leading up to the summer of 2014, he still wasn't uh, quite as like nowhere near as like big or as able to like most of his GoFundMe's would only raise somewhere around 1,500, 2,000, 3,000 things like that, and um, uh, I think that well he, they definitely got a lot of press when they went to those news agencies local in Arizona. One of the news agencies happened to flash my last name on screen, so I started because I was I was calling all of them, saying, "What the fuck is this hit piece? Like, I don't I have a right to say something?" And the one I said, "You guys put my fucking name on like your fucking uh, st uh, story, and you don't even talk to me." So they interviewed me, and they didn't even use like any of it. They had like this one and a half minute long thing where they cut out everything I said. They they actually say he says it was just a spat over politics. I have the original Skype. Um, um, I recorded it uh, interview I did with the producer because I never talked to any of the journalists, where I specifically said this has nothing to do with politics. It's about what he did to Jan, and it's about doxing. And so they covered it up. So then I hit him up again I said this is all bullshit and I want to say within a month and a half of all those news stories airing all of them went down because I kept sending him shit like, like Brian's racism Brian's doxing Brian's you know all kinds of shit and they all just like uh, they shut it you cannot find those interviews uh, online anymore uh, because they chose to just nuke the whole fucking thing than actually tell the truth because it was propaganda to begin with well and that was and, that was pretty much the last time that the news ever fucking did a goddamn thing about regarding Brian. Um, you know, I'm not counting Huckabee Show on Fox or OAN, but uh, up until the end of 2018, really the beginning of 2019, after his um, uh, uh, the build the wall GoFundMe um, mm -hmm. was astroturfed and took off and everything, did the news finally like mainstream news finally fucking look into him? And the but. Before that happened, I want to tell you all real quick what happened. Uh, my buddy Wade had got a, uh, he messaged me. I, bra I, I had a brain tumor, and I wrote a post about it on my old page called Dr. Hannibal Lecter and the Ministry of Dumb Fuckery. So Wade saw this uh, thing, that, and he messaged me. Well, we got to be fast friends, and Wade is fantastic uh, He's funny as fuck, and he had a uh, page called Barack Obama's Werewolf Army, and we were just trolling Republicans like Brian, whatever. So, well, keep <clears throat> keep in mind when you say trolling, we're not talking about these like seeking people out and just ripping into them. We're talking about lighthearted satire right. that was mocking their reactions more than anything. It, it was mocking no how stupid bullying. they were. Yeah, we yeah, weren't doxing no them and. Or trying to get people to get them killed or anything like that. We were using our wit and humor to fuck with these dumbasses. And we would post it on our page. And uh, <clears throat> so Wade messaged me one time. We got to be fast friends. And then I told him, he, I said, you know, you should be uh, doing this. So he made this page or whatever. So Wade also, he when he messaged me on my page, he had, uh, uh, he had a brain tumor too. Well, <clears throat> after... I don't know how, I can't remember how long it was. It was about a year later. Well, his tumor came back. He's got a colloidal cyst that uh, turns his brain into cheese. So uh, so Wade was going to have to be off work for like three months or whatever. So, And Keep everybody mind, Wade just... Was, Wade was an Air Force veteran, too. Yeah, he, Wade's an Air Force veteran. <clears throat> and everybody just loves Wade. Uh, so when uh, he, he, he was worried about paying bills so we started GoFundMe. So and we raised uh all he needed too within a few days. And uh, so Brian sees this and Brian says, Well I wanna help help out a fellow Air Force veteran. I'll I'll sell some T shirts on my page. 
So we don't know how much money Brian uh, raised. We do know that he didn't give Wade the money that he raised for like 18 months uh, because uh, the GoFundMe that we did uh, it raised over 10,000 bucks and it, Wade was able to you know have the time off that he needed to recover from a surgery and pay his bills and uh, he didn't much need Brian but it wasn't that that Brian had gotten but so you, big by then that he was he wasn't doing it you, so the, the lawsuit was ongoing it was probably like I want to say what like uh, maybe a uh, seven eight nine months in and I remember you specifically coming to me with this in like August of 20. 14 or September of 2014 and you basically told me like don't say a fucking thing like we're gonna sit on this and we're gonna see how long we can do it uh, like hold out to make it look even worse yeah it was it was <laughs> and I <laughs> it was a good plan and it worked splendidly so I knew that Brian couldn't uh, one of the thing one of the other grifts that Brian had and I don't know why this didn't get caught up by that because I reported this to the Florida Attorney General and then uh, Postal Inspectors the United States Postal Inspector but Brian had a go uh, GoFundMe for Brett Kavanaugh yeah Brett because yeah. defend Judge Kavanaugh he needs defending from the libtards yeah so send Brian money and he raised like seven hundred thousand dollars for it and Brian said uh, that he donated the money to Catholic Charities and if you believe a grifting shitbag like Colfage uh, gave that money to Catholic Charities in Washington, D.C., I got a bridge to sell you. Cheap. Well, he he also had the GoFundMe for, uh, what was his name, Something Spencer. The I think it was also another person who was in the air, no, he was an Air Force veteran who was home who got beat up or something in a fight, but there was also the uh, the... the Vet, the service member that was on the train with the, during the terrorist attack in France or something, he had two different GoFundMe's for both of them. Neither of them ever received the money. Um, yeah, there's a whole laundry list of like, there's got to be at yeah, least a I'm, dozen. Uh, he go was grifting all along because he didn't want to go to work. And one of the things that he was telling people, Brian, did, he went to school for architecture. So he's got an yeah. Instagram following, and he's he's flying in private jets. He's got a he's uh, in a Pagani Pagani Hira, which was like a million dollar car, and he buys this new boat. So everybody's wondering where he's getting this money from, and he says, "I'm a day trade investor. I've I've got I'm very good at it. I'm very uh, an architect." Yeah, right. Uh, suddenly is becoming a day trader genius making all this money well, and he's donating he 700,000 <laughs> yeah he never worked as an architect he graduated but uh, he, uh, he he was a good day trader and he donated the money to, to, to the Catholic Charities for $700,000 for Brett Kavanaugh that was nice of him because he's generous and shit so none of this shit makes sense or whatever and something happened I think Brian was going to run for Congress or something and so I posted a story about him fucking Wade out of this money, raising money for Wade and keeping the money. And he was real sore about it. And I made sure he saw it, too. Well, that and was so also, he, you, worked, you worked with me on the script. That was also yeah. the fir very first time that I did Hunter Thompson in that video. Yeah. Uh, we, we, were, we were on the trail of Herbgate. <laughs> <laughs> and we were talking about we we were we did some YouTube videos. Fuck, how long ago was that, Louie? I don't even remember. I was living in Jeffersonville, uh, so I was like six, seven, eight years ago. Has it been that fucking the, the, long? Uh, God, well, it, it it was it was the lawsuit was still going on. So I remember I was doing a lot of those in the spring and summer of um. Well, I was I was the one who was left in like the lawsuit or whatever, mm. and. So I want to say, because that was my only platform, because he was still like running his mouth and defaming us and stuff like that. Yeah. So we would do these live streams just to kind of like explain things and shit, and also just be complete morons. I yeah. think I even tucked my dick between my legs in one. <laughs> <laughs> Louie, that's not suitable for Facebook. Yeah, but we were we were going pretty hard. So Brian sees either this post I did on American News X, my 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 blog. Or he saw one of the videos, whatever. He's like, oh, man, I totally flaked on the... He tells uh, Wade, I totally flaked on it. Sorry, let me send you the money for that. So he's trying, talking to Wade, getting his...
PayPal information, which he knew it w what it was anyway. And he sent Wade you like... Had the messages. Uh, yeah. He sent Wade you like 1,100... He had he sent I Wade. I want to save his last. Yeah, uh, well, he sent Wade like eleven hundred bucks. We don't know how much money he raised from his T-shirt, whatever. And uh, and just the the way I knew because it had been eighteen months, and he completely flaked. He completely forgot to give the money that he raised for a fellow Air Force veteran. So Brian but, was toying with the, the idea of running for for Congress, is what it was. Well, the, the story, though, that he had given to you guys was how it flaked. It, it, he forgot. But then he went to his page, and, and remember he doctored uh, the chat, the Facebook chats between... Yeah, 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 yeah. I forgot about that. And, 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 yeah. and, and, and he, he did the uh, Photoshopping so bad that one of the dates was August 28th. Or <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. RD. Yeah, it was... Uh, he, he tried to... Photoshop these uh, these texts that he had with Wade that he make it look like Wade responding right. I tried to give Wade the money, but he didn't. it was all bullshit because he's a grifting shitbag. Everything he lies with every breath that he takes. And when I was interacting with Brian, one of the things I told him, I said, Brian, uh, you need to get straight. You need to you need to uh, start living right because you're going to end up in jail. You're going to end up in prison if you don't. Um, stop it. I wish I had my old account because with that well, uh, with well, that with that conversation because I said Brian and between. after he did that shit to wait I told him again I said motherfucker I, I told him the last message I, I the last time I talked to Brian in message I said I said I'm gonna make sure you end up in prison motherfucker and well the between the weed and then it turns out because he tried to sue me because i made a joke about i used to say things like oh uh, what you know brian's acting crazy today maybe he didn't take his freedom pills and like <laughs> you know and it, it, that was one of the things they tried to sue me for if you looked at the lawsuit one of the things they're suing me for for defamation was that because i said he shits in a bucket and dumps it out his house <laughs> and and the lawsuit actually says brian kofaj <laughs> Lawsuit says Brian Kofaj does uh, does not engage in any fecal related activities. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but yeah, you know, and then it came out like uh, they took his pills away when right before he went to trial. You know, the yeah, Brian's trial. been yeah, here's 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 a, here's a funny thing. I love this too. Is that Brian was on uh, a bunch of uh, opioids, and yeah. I told him that wasn't going to be fun. I, that was another thing that I told him about. I was well, you know why they uh, do that, by the way, right? Uh, they, 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 if they're going to take you to trial and they're going to have you testify and shit, they need yeah, to prove that you're clean and sober. Uh, yeah. And here's the problem. Here's the problem. Uh, if Kofaj has a drug problem, I don't know how he can get clean and sober with a 12-step program. Yeah. <laughs> get it? Get it? <laughs> he's got no legs. <laughs> he's got no legs. You know, uh, trust me, if you think that we're making fun of somebody, a wounded warrior, trust me, he richly deserves it. He was first class scum. And in case you don't know, Brian. Brian is. What do you call someone like Kofaj who self medicates with drugs and gambling? A high roller. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is us gloating. This is letting out a lot of, uh, all, I mean, because we've been dealing with this shit bag. And it took us, fuck, how long to get him? I don't know, eight years? Was that uh, how long? Yeah, it? well, I mean, this, this uh, we build the wall thing was so gratuitous, so over the top that, yeah. it, you know, that's what attracted the attention, uh, you know, because it's a GoFundMe that ends up raising $20 million. Now, it wasn't 20 million. Those. It wasn't 20 million. Well, no, it wasn't. No. They didn't uh, even get, I don't think they got the, I don't think the federal prosecutors got to the cash because he well, had what, drop what stations. Doing, he had drop stations. He, he had a um, taking money. I, and and redistributing it back into the, the GoFundMe to bump the numbers up. But what he was doing is taking money out of the bank account, putting it back. Like they were, they had like people making donations called Robin the Bank was like their name and shit like that. <laughs> and somebody made like a one million dollar donation, an anonymous person. Like just it it was sketchy. It was like we're you know and yeah you, the the Dropbox that they had in Colorado, um, was it was a PO box. Which I remember you posted, you did the Google Street View of, of that weird little tiny, you know, shop strip mall where the, the P.O. box was. Mm -hmm. And the people who were involved in that originally would not, were not uh, um, 
uh, they wanted to remain anonymous, they said, for their safety and all this other bullshit, turned out to be Amanda and Timothy Shea. Timothy Shea, of course, just got sentenced. Uh, there was actually originally a mistrial back in summer. Just got tried. Yeah, he had, he had a, you know, for, yeah. for you all that don't know or didn't see the post that I made about it, uh, Timothy Shea got a one T-Billy fuck stick on his jury. And he said, I don't believe I think it's a frame up. It's a conspiracy. So the vote yeah, against him was 11 to 1. So he got a mistrial, the, and they tried him again though, and convicted him. Even though the text messages in the trial that they used to prove it is literally like Timothy Shea and Brian Kofodge saying, we, I hope we don't get caught because this is a crime. Like, <laughs> like, like, so this guy was just the, this one juror that held out in the, in the first trial for Timothy Shea was just blatant. Like, he should actually be tried. Uh, he should be charged, actually, because, he, the, he, you know, you're supposed to be impartial. You swear in saying you're going to be impartial. You can't. Yeah. You, I mean, there, there's no uh, you, there's no impartial. Like, just the fact that you would look over the uh, the amounting of evidence and just to hang the jury up. Which was yeah. pointless because you knew that they're going to try him again. Like and they, they did and convicted him. Uh, yeah. convicted. He tried to yeah. hell out, and he's going to get it worse than Colfage. Colfage, Colfage took a plea bargain after. Well, who because, do you and think, well, let's go back. Well, hold on a second. Let me let me let me say something real quick. Uh, that this guy right here. I'm the one that told. I'm the one that sent the emails to the Florida Attorney General and the United States Postal Service because my dad had a client one time that did that, and uh, my dad told my dad told was committing a little bit of wire fraud, and so uh, uh, my dad was somehow involved with it. Or where he found out about some guy that uh, I think it was a politician of some kind that was doing some kind of wire fraud or whatever, and uh, dad. And I remember Dad calling the United States Postal Inspector and making a report there. And then the next call he made was to the Attorney General, and the, well, <laughs> that guy got roasted. So I knew I knew to contact whenever you have, there's a wire fraud case, you contact the, uh, uh, the Postal Service because they're the ones that do that well, kind of investigation. For, for, for anyone who doesn't know, like your dad, who has the same name, your junior, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Your dad's like what? Like the biggest named lawyer in Kentucky? Yeah. Yeah, my dad's like, a big shot in Kentucky, and when when the shyster Logan Aaliyah saw that my my dad was like in the, I don't know, there's some kind of lawyer thing where you know it's, they're called super lawyers and there's some kind of rating system and my dad's rated at one of these super lawyer things and he saw my, who my dad is, was and he was like he didn't want to sue is, me for some reason, which is why you got to email him all the time telling him to go fuck himself with a glass canvas. <laughs> I did, I did. I, every fucking time I could fuck with that dumb shit, I did. I, I, I wrecked him as much as I possibly could. And he richly deserved it, too, because he's nothing but a shitbag. But Colfage, here's the thing that we don't know, and I don't think that, I wish that U.S. attorneys had done been more diligent about it, but that, I mean, they, once they have it, I think he raised $28 million. I don't know how much, but we don't know how much money he got in the cash at the drop box. And because I'm guessing it wasn't was a small it. chump of change. I'm guessing yeah, the checks that was, and that kind of shit wasn't a small were, amount of money. People, the, the thing about the drop box was this was something he was promoting because a lot of, most of Kovacic's fans are geriatrics and they didn't understand the whole GoFundMe thing and all that <laughs> yeah, stuff. So yeah, he yeah, was yeah. Having them send checks and cash but if you they were sending a check they were making it out to his name they were instructed to make yeah. it out to his name to this PO yeah. box so you have no idea like you know how much of this money was like you know how, how much they had collected or anything I'm I don't understand how Tim Shea's wife Amanda uh, didn't you know get busted but I mean they took away their guns um, the feds took away Kofaj's guns his guns and yeah he had quite a gun seen, collection too and he was worried about the Dems coming to get him Amanda, Amanda, I think um, she, I think she must have had a uh, some sort of medical incident, maybe where maybe uh, she was consuming her caloric intake was more than uh, her body could produce. So, uh, well, or burn off, I should say, because she went from a quite, um, you know, uh, small woman to a quite large woman. And we're going uh, yeah, to talk about that in Mile, <laughs> uh, because and she was she was team? going on she was going on the Blaze, which she was a correspondent for the Blaze or whatever. 
And whenever she would go in there, she would use a picture of a file photo of her that, that was when she was a teenager. For ten years ago. <laughs> yeah, Photoshop. And it was, and yes, we're making fun of her. Yeah, she's well, a horrible, you, I, horrible I got, I got person. Me a pair. I got me a pair of Amanda Shea teeth. <laughs> you like them? <laughs> I mean, expecting her to start braying like a donkey every time I see her fat face. Yeah, she is so fat. And then, and then her husband, Timothy Shea. Have you seen pictures there of him? They have him. He's all puffing up. You know, he's got his like um, tight-lipped puffing up. And this guy looks like. I mean, you're. I mean, if you were have, had a movie and you wanted a someone to play like a, a mincing pedophile youth minister, like this is the guy. Like this guy yeah. would never let children around. Timothy Shea. Mm -hmm. He looks. And like here, he's here's the funny thing. Here's the funny thing about them too is that they were weren't they absconded felons that they got a charge in Colorado? They were under indictment oh, no, no. for trafficking and uh, marijuana or something. Oh no, you're thinking about Dustin Stockton and. Oh, there was a girl. They they end up. Somebody wrote an article about them, calling them inappropriately. I think calling them the Bonnie and Clyde of MAGA. Now you're thinking like <laughs> outlaws, like they're outlaws or something. No, you know what they did? They ratted out everybody at the January sixth um, protest. They oh, were there, was and that? when the when the feds came to talk to them, they ratted everybody. Like this. Well, Amanda was rats. there though. Amanda was it? Wasn't she at uh, January sixth too? Doing a, um, she, who was she a cor, oh, who was she corresponding for? Was it the Blaze Glenn Beck's program? No, Bannon, Bannon, oh. Bannon TV. Oh, she was a Bannon TV. Okay, yeah, I couldn't yeah, remember yeah, which ship bag organization. Ah, yeah. And uh, it just so happens that when when all this shit happened, I couldn't believe I couldn't believe when it happened because I, I reported. Uh, I, I reported. That's, that doesn't, doesn't, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just letting you know. Yeah. Dustin Stockton and Jennifer Lawrence were the two that got busted crossing state lines with drugs. Ah, um, I, I, I couldn't. Also, I couldn't keep uh, track of who that was. Please forgive me, Amanda Shea, and continue grazing. I don't want to interrupt you. But uh, I have what, the article. I, I'll just say it right. Anyways, uh, it says both Lawrence and Stockton were charged with transporting narcotics, the kind of qualities you look for in a person to help manage twenty million dollars of other people's money. <laughs> yeah. It says according to uh, Missouri Highway Patrol, Jennifer Lawrence, thirty, and Dustin Stockton, thirty-five, both of Reno, Nevada, were arrested at approximately eleven forty-five a.m. Monday. This is like an article. If you put in their names, it would pop up. And they also, I think, they run accounts on um, uh, Stormfront as well if i actually have screen caps of this i nobody ever thought to look because stormfront was kind of forgotten about stormfront was loaded with posts advertising and promoting we build the wall oh and was I, it I, know, like, I, like, I, like, yeah and i got shit loads of uh um uh, those stalker of the different posts. Those, those fuckers that were fucking with me the bridge if you remember those fuckers they mm -hmm. posted my name and social security number on the stormfront and uh <clears throat> put pictures of the house I used to live in and were encouraging these fucking idiots to try to kill me. I was a race trader. And actually, when I contacted him, they, they, uh, the Stormfront, that guy was really cool with me. He said, we're not all fucking idiots. And he took the shit down right away. I was kind of surprised. Well, they probably, this, yeah, they probably don't want the heat. Like, you know, yeah. start, you know, the FBI, all you need is you're giving, you don't want to give them a reason to start looking yeah, at you as them. domestic terrorists. <laughs> yeah, and uh, that didn't turn out too well for the bridge, uh, honestly. I, I think there, I was rather satisfied with the result of wrecking those fuckers. I was uh, pretty happy with. And that's kind of how this all, all this shit I got into Colfage. But these right-winger lunatics, they constantly say uh, we're polluting Facebook with all this n nattering bullshit. And they're shameless. They're shameless. Colfage, I mean, they were so brazen about how they stole the money. And they said, not one cent, not a single solitary cent is ever going to go. We won't take a cent. It's all going for the wall. And when they elect, and when they erected this kind of shit, were they going after Mary Ann's? Were they trying to go through her property? We have this friend named Mary Ann Tre 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 Trevino. And she's Trevino got a... Uh, right. Right. Yeah. And she... Uh, Trevino right. She, she's a, uh, what is she? She's like the, basically the person who runs the uh, butterfly sanctuary in uh, uh, Texas. 
and uh, they weren't trying to build a wall necessarily through. She was actually fighting. I think it was uh, plans or talk of building a wall, like federally, not not Kofage's wall, which was only built on like the construction site in Florida by the construction company, the uh, Tommy Fisher Fisher Industries, that was yeah, and, that they were going to build it. And in case y'all don't know Tommy Fisher's story, he's a fucking grifting shitbag too. And he's like from North Dakota or something. And he w he was advocating. He wanted to get a government contract to build the wall. And he was blowing all the sunshine up uh, Trump's ass. And Steve Bannon and Brian Colfage were having the war room discussion with them uh, with this asshole on it while they're stealing money. So they hired him, and I don't know how much cash they gave that bastard. I think it was like two million bucks to build a section of the wall that's literally falling down. They're having the state of Texas, or the Department of Agriculture, I can't remember, some department suing that we build the wall to tear yeah, down the wall the that they up. did build because it's so fucking awful. It's it's falling, and they didn't, uh, they didn't build the foundation correctly, and due to like rain runoff and just things that a normal person living in the area should know about yeah. um, it's washing it's washing like Mary Ann Trevino Wright has a picture of herself crawling under the big giant hole underneath the wall where you can see the yeah. foundation is probably only about a foot deep and and there's like three feet of, of dirt that had been washed away underneath what? the foundation <laughs> so it's literally about to cave and fall into the Rio Grande and um, uh, and there were some issues with the uh, the mayor uh, mayor in a town in Florida where Fisher Industries was, and there's been a lot of drama uh, and different lawsuits and things like that because they were they had everything from militia members hanging around them. They would uh, use like Brian at one point Brian Kovach was claiming that the mayor of this like town in Florida was like uh, uh, owned by the cartel members. And uh, then he claimed that Mariana Trevino Wright and the butterfly, a butterfly sanctuary, had severed heads buried all over the property. Uh, yeah, and, like, he just came up. Like, they they were shit. stochastic terrorism. That's what these fuckers were good at. Yeah, yeah. And he came out and said that she was in a pedophile ring or some shit. And uh, all she does, all this woman does is run a butterfly sanctuary. Because the butterflies are from pesticides and shit. She's trying to keep the... Butterflies uh, still going because insecticide they're killing or whatever. So she she has this preserve there and it, she's minding her own business. And this shit bag comes down there. Brian Colfies and Steve Bannon. Most, most of the bi the visitors to that butterfly sanctuary are like um, uh, students. Like it's a bit. She organizes things for students to come out from different schools and stuff like that. They have like a, a building, you know, where they got probably have like. You know different setups you know stands and things like that and then the property all around it which i want to say is like it's federal land and yeah. uh and it's basically the federal land is like it's it's already been determined to not upset this land because of like you know the uh, you know it's like a, it's literally it's a sanctuary for fucking uh, butterflies to not destroy or upset like the uh uh ecosystem and uh the, the various species of butterflies that are in this area and uh, it's totally, I, you would never even, it would never even cross your mind that something like that would be politicized or, uh, or, or uh, you know, come under fire or anything. It's so bizarre. And the only thing I could think of is that that's what Kofage does. He picks easy targets to demonize and attack to, pr to promote himself and, and whatever grift he's running. And that's and, what, it, um, and that's exactly what happened. And he think he was like, oh, and him and Steve Bannon kept having live podcasts from down there or whatever. And it looks like Steve Bannon got a million dollars, and Brian Colfaz got three hundred fifty thousand, and they weren't going to take a penny. And uh, and we don't know whatever whatever other expenses they had, but they came in and seized all the assets, and then suddenly Brian's not running around on a private jet anymore. How'd that happen? And apparently the boat payment stopped. Yeah, the million dollar boat payment stopped. And he had two Range Rovers and he's got no legs, one arm. He's got one arm. What's he well, driving yeah, around in two Range Rovers and uh, and prancing around town in a million dollar Pagani for fuck's sakes? Well, uh, apparently there was a mortgage of somewhere around just over $200,000. And uh, I'm not sure if you remember this, this uh, just kind of like a mystery woman at first. I actually did do kind of like a mini interview with her um, where I was, I was referring to her as like just Karen to protect her identity. She's still around. Um, I'll probably have to 
pull her number. I'm not going to say her real name on here just because I mean, she lived near Colfage in Florida. And she uh, she was the one who came up with all the records she found where it was like people were donating money named Robin to Bank. And a lot of them, she said, it looked like somebody <laughs> just mashed a bunch of like just a ma- much of random, you know, um, uh, letters like they were just mm. like just so many like somebody was just like, I got to make, you know, let's say 300 donations to this GoFundMe with all this this money. So they're just, you know, like that's what I mean. They're cycling the money through to bump the numbers yeah, because up of the GoFundMe. In, in case you all don't know, what happens is, is if you get a bunch of donations, it keeps uh, on GoFundMe, Go, Go, GoFundMe sites, it keeps, it's just like uh, any other algorithm. The pe- places that are getting most good donations get listed first in the thing. And so Brian was listing that first to get as many shit back, dumb shits to give money to his thing. So he would uh, donate money that he had from other things to make it still look like it was a live thing because that's what yeah, it was. Yeah, make it uh, look like it was, uh, 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 what do you call it? Like it was AstroTurf, but he wanted to make it look like it was a grassroots thing that just took off within a week. Now, right. the funny thing, too, is like not not even two days after he started that GoFundMe before it hadn't got anywhere near that much money. OAN ran a story. Fox News ran it like it, they had a network of, of like a satellite network that promoted that thing from day one, including several different right, right wing websites and stuff like that. So it was like planned out. They didn't just launch and then people heard about it like from OAN News or, you know, uh, Fox News or whatever. It was like, hey, when that when that thing goes up, let us know and we'll we'll have you on TV two days later to promote it. And it was it was it's all it was so fake. And I'm not sure if they realized what they were complicit in, like some of these news agencies or whatever, or these like, you know, uh, opinionated uh, uh, news agencies. But um, uh, maybe they thought like maybe it's just about making a statement. If you just raise twenty million dollars to build a wall, then that owns the libs because look how many it's 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 in itself was an advocacy really probably still for a federal border wall it was never meant to actually build a wall but it was acting as like a promoter of the wall based on look how popular it is in just one week look how many people want this wall and um it wasn't too long after um you know after that uh, now remember that he changed the rules on the gofundme and then gofundme still didn't shut him down and they created like an opt-in program or whatever just to keep it going but when they started uh, uh, doing, you, they, we, we saw what they were doing with the money. Like I had it, wrote about it in like the one uh, blog that I had. They started just going on like a weird uh, tour of like, like a carnival fucking tour where they'd go to different cities and they had paid speakers. You know, you had the, these angel moms. Promoting it, yeah. And, yeah, yeah they were flying all promoting. around the country. We're, we're taking angel moms with us because we're good people. Yeah. yeah, it was it was a uh, it was a low end like kind of trashy. Uh, uh, it's just sort of like a speaking uh, tour. That's what they were using the money for originally. Now I think that's one way they were legally funneling the money, uh, uh, you know, to like people like Steve Bannon and shit because you have to pay speakers. Uh, they also had uh, what's his name who ran. Uh, he wound up running again for senator. Um, Chris Kobach. Chris Kobach. Yes, yes. Yeah. And there was questions because Chris Kobach had oh my gosh. an email list, which was like a violent right, right. campaign. Campaign yeah. fund. I know. I was so. I was. I swear to God, I was. I was praying. I didn't tell anybody why I was praying that he would get the nomination because we would have definitely uh, won that seat because I had so much garbage on him being involved in that suit and knowing that uh, he was participating in the crime. And I don't know why he didn't get charged along with him. I guess well, maybe sure. he's too high profile. And you would think Steve Bannon would be too. When that day happened, when they finally busted those sons of bitches, I mean, and I woke See, up, I was dead asleep in California, and when they called, I was just like, holy shit. I had no idea that uh, Bannon was I, involved I was, in the We Build the Wall. Thing. Right, right, neither did I. I was like, and you know how crazy I sound, by the way, because I think you can agree that the press has shafted me royally. Um, mm-hmm. Like nobody talked about his initial um, GoFundMe about uh, a, a, a wounded warrior mentoring program, and I reached out to news agencies and all kinds of people for years with with all the stuff I had saved. And keep in mind that all the stuff I saved would not doesn't exist anymore because the Facebook pages he originally posted on were gone, and all these other things. Even the GoFundMe was gone. But I still had I still have the uh, by the way I still have the original links which I preserved. Now, granted, they're all broken, but I preserved the links to prove, like myself in court, 
like because why yeah. would I submit a fake link? You know, because I I knew they were scrubbing evidence when he was at the time he was suing me, and one of the things they were suing me for was me calling uh, that that crowdfunder a scam. And um, you can put those links but, in a Wayback machine though, and they, they should pop up. Not, not not Facebook though. Wayback doesn't do Facebook. Ah, okay. And this yeah, is the something volume I, would be just I massive. Yeah, and this is something I found out uh, more recently because I never used the Wayback Machine. But they credit uh, when BuzzFeed ran the story about Kofaj's um, wounded mentoring program, Crowdfunder, where she used uh, all like the evidence because I was talking to her and everything and uh, gave her all this evidence and stuff. She didn't credit me and she credited my own screen caps to the Wayback Machine. And <laughs> and so I went ahead and I checked and I'm like Brianna, oh, yeah, is one. that the one that did that? Brianna, yeah, Bri Brianna yeah. Sachs. And I I played nice. I was so annoyed with that, but I played nice for a while because it was nice to finally get some kind of like, you know, national news finally covering Kofaj. But I like I, you, you have no idea for all these years when I would try telling someone the Kofaj story, no one be no one could believe it like what i went through no one like like it's like you can tell that they just didn't like and then then now when steve bannon gets busted you realize i sound like a fucking uh a schizophrenic if i'm like yeah and then and then we did this thing and then all of a sudden the, the, the president's own guy gets but i just sound like a crazy person and so I, all i i don't want money i don't want money i just want these motherfuckers to finally credit me because they used all my shit like yeah i'll tell you i'll tell you a funny story uh, when the Brianna Taylor shit happened, uh, and oh, she was Max. killed, yeah, no, not her. Oh, oh, oh. Brianna oh, okay. Taylor. She, oh, Brianna yeah, Taylor yeah. was killed. Well, one of the cops, this guy named Brett Hankinson, this piece of shit. Well, I had reported him to uh, Internal Affairs in 2008 because I knew two women that he raped. And uh, somebody I can't remember who, one of my followers or friends, sent me a thing that. Uh, about this Twitter, uh, this thing on Twitter about this guy named Roberto Ferdman, and he's uh, he used to work for the Washington Post, and he got nominated for a Pulitzer, I think, uh, and he deserves a Pulitzer. He's a top shelf guy, real smart, but he was doing an uh, investigation in the Louisville Metro the Police Department. So I'm talking to him, and I'm giving him all kinds of information, and telling him that you know he sh if he can get my dad to talk to him, my dad would steer him in the right direction. Plus, I told him you know. Uh, a whole bunch of other shit that I knew because it was funny because the night that I contacted him he had gotten the internal affairs reports on Brett Hankison and he was reading it and he was reading my uh, report to internal affairs and one of my dad's friends I'll, ne I'll never forget this dad represented a bunch of cops usually and when he was representing cops it was cops that get fired from the Louisville police because they were beating up the blackens out at Naval Ordnance and that kind of shit, or planting of it, it's all kinds of horrible shit. So dad would uh, defend them and get their jobs back. And uh, so one of the one of the times there, there's this uh, duty sergeant there, and he's talking to my dad and telling him they were talking about internal affairs or something. He's like, "Yeah, that's where all the fucking," he said, "That's where all the crooks go to uh, wait to get their pension." Uh, at the yeah, internal I don't trust affair. internal affairs. Yeah. I, oh, I doubt. See, well, well here, and, Tom, Tom, there's stories that led up to Colfage that I think kind of prepared me for it. And I don't know if I ever told you the story about um, when I was dealing with internal affairs regarding an off-duty Wayne County Sheriff's deputy that was hanging out in a blind pig run by the son of a Chaldean mafia boss who was doing like 26 years in prison. Uh, funny thing is, I think Donald Trump was trying to have him deported because he was like sentence was coming up. This was the, this Keldian godfather named Louis Akrawi. Anyways, uh, uh, my brother was uh, uh, kind of like a Joe Pesci from uh, Goodfellas type, and he would hang around with some of these people. And something happened where this off-duty cop put like nine bullets in my brother's back, just like pumped him full of lead, killed him. And um, it all got covered up, and I was dealing with internal affairs through uh, Wayne County, and I remember his name, Lieutenant Robert Wood, and these motherfuckers, like, all he did was, like, lie to me. Like, I was trying to find out, like, just, just I'm like, well, okay, why is this cop, did you guys drug test him? Did you find out if he was drinking that night? Uh, I'm talking to people that knew my brother and knew this guy who said that they sold drugs out of this place, or they had this, this, and that. What's he doing hanging out with this guy? And, and he was also the same deputy was also at the time on desk duty for pulling his gun out in a bar and pistol whipping someone you know several months prior so the guy's like a piece of shit 
and uh, like, and he would he was feeding me shit to like because he wanted me to. It turned out what he wanted for me is he wanted to have a like a, 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 a like a, a, a head like he wanted to know what was coming in case like we were going to do something like sue or whatever and he was just like stroking me on he was telling me that he had undercover cops at my brother's funeral for my protection um like all kinds of shit and i finally got i finally started i was like this guy is like there's something off about him and uh and for the first time ever he called me we knew all our phones were tapped like like my dad my sister like we proved it and everything Mm -hmm. and um which is well out of their jurisdiction because we're not even in wayne county and we're also not criminal suspects but um uh i was sending all these text messages saying i'm gonna call him and i'm gonna i'm gonna gonna record him when i talk to him and i'm gonna make him retell me all these things he told me in the past and i didn't call him he ends up calling me up uh, for the first time ever, um, never called me before. Just calls me up saying, hey, "What's going on? What's going?" On? And he's like, "Listen, why don't you come down to the station? I, I think I want to meet you." Blah blah blah. And I'm like, "This is like I'm imagining myself getting mugged, you know, on the way to the station yeah. type of thing." And um, so I went over to my mom's house, filled her in on everything because she didn't really know I was doing this at the time. She calls him up. He immediately accuses her of. Ha- of- <laughs> No, go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm just going to run and oh, get a, another drink out of my refrigerator. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, she, he immediately immediately accuses my mother of um, taping the conversation, which I thought was odd because, but he, you know, it might have been something like that's what makes me think that he somehow saw my text message and shit where I was talking about recording him. Then she starts to, I'm writing things down on a pad of paper and handing it to her because I didn't want him to know I was like in the same room. And I'm having her ask, um, hey, did you tell my son that you had undercover cops at, at my son's funeral? And he's like, I never said that. Blah, blah. And he, he, I listened to this motherfucker lie to like my mom. He starts accusing her of shit. He starts asking her what, where she works, like yelling at her. You better tell me where you work. Who, who's your employer? Who's, where do you live? Like all this shit. And I'm like, it was a complete other side of him that he never showed me. With me, he had always showed, yes, I'm a concerned guy looking to weed out the bad eggs in our department and blah, blah, blah. And, and you, you got to keep coming to me and giving me what you hear and what you know because that'll help us. And then when it, when it came to my mother speaking to him, it was literal, like just total intimidation, bullying, uh, you know, accusatory, lying. Just to hear the cop lie, this internal affairs cop lie. And like, that just, that really made, that's what ruined, I mean, if anything, that, that's what makes me hate cops or I can never trust a cop. I just saw, I just thought to myself, how despicable. You know that this guy is hanging around with fucking wannabe gangsters and drug houses and shooting people and you don't even care to get rid of him. All you care about mm. is attacking the grieving mother of the person he killed, like, yeah. and, and bullying her. Like, and like, to me, right that, that moment there, I, I have to laugh at all the propaganda of all these fucking cop shows that they've had on since the 1980s on up, where cops are always going, oh, internal affairs is on my ass. No, they're not. No, they're no, not. They're not. <laughs> they, don't get, they cover your ass. They don't, do, they don't investigate you. They, they don't do that shit. But it's propaganda. And, it, yeah, it's propaganda because they want us, the citizenry, to sit there and believe that there actually is hope for some kind of accountability. And there ain't. Right. There is. There's there never. Be. I have a. I have a. I have a uh, a friend, Shelly, who lives in Texas, and she uh, she went through almost the same thing, and um, and I I rail about the police to everybody, uh, all my friends here, because I don't because propaganda has worked and it's worked fantastic to convince people that cops are good people. No, they're not. They're fucking amoral, uh, lying shitbags, all of them, and. Uh, I mean, I've got, I've got, I could go on horror stories with the, I mean, the, these, the, the ones that my dad represented, the, the worst ones were the narcotics detectives. They have no ethics, no morals or whatever. Oh, fuck. They, and, 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 and they have, they're the dirtiest of the dirty. Any, if you know a yeah. narcotics detective, back away slowly, get away, uh, because they all, they're all liars. They frame people all the time because they have quotas. And, uh, I actually... I'm going to put out a piece. I've been writing this thing, this told me. I, until you came on, I was going to work on that today. So, sorry, fam. I, I may not get it finished by today. But um, 
Harvey Sloan was this Democratic mayor that got elected, and one of the things that he put out, my dad represented the chief of police, although I didn't, I didn't meet him when my dad was representing him, but uh, Harvey Sloan told the chief of, chief of police and a guy named Richard Dotson that he had to cut out the quota system. So one of my dad's, uh, this duty sergeant, this motherfucker, and he, he was a very affable guy. You like him, and he had really good war stories that they'd amused me when I was a teenager. And then when I thought back about him when I was older, I was like, shit, that guy's a fucking monster. So he's talking about the quota system. He's like, yeah, the mayor kind of laid it down on the quota. We can't, we can't have quotas, so we tore up all the paperwork. But anybody that tells you there's not a, they're not quotas, uh, there aren't quotas as a liar. And the reason why it is is because, and this is the thing that I wish I could get people to fully understand, and th they never will. Even, even all the people that like me and are part of my family, they won't ever understand this. But uh, the police, uh, you know, if, if you look at the uh, reports of violent crime from like the 1990s until now, it's decreased by 40%. And yeah, then the yeah. police, the police budgets are always increasing. Well, increasing. why do they? If if the crime's going down, you would think we would need less police officers. We have more police officers now than we've ever had ever. And you think, oh well, we need to freeze hiring. We need to. We don't need to hire. Them. No, because what the police will do is they'll go out and arrest people to gin up the crime numbers to make it look like there's a wave, crime wave coming, and we need to, we need to, we need more cops because more cops equals more safety. No, it doesn't. We've never tried cutting police forces and then seeing if crime goes up. Because it's the stupidity well, of Americans that always say, oh, well, if, we, if there's less cops, there's going to be more crime. There will be less crime with less cops because cops are the fucking criminals. And that's the well, problem here's, here's, that people don't understand. Here's the thing. Here's the thing, too, is like when I was a kid, like I loved Dick Tracy. Like, mm -hmm. like I read comics, like my dad yeah. would buy me like the old 1940s, 30s comics. And, um, and that kind of like fueled me, I think, to, you know, be into like, you know, especially like the FBI's like behavioral science department. And, um, you know, like, the, I like, love that. I read, I, I love that stuff. I read psychology for four solid years because of, because yeah, of, uh, yeah. Michael Douglas, that famous FBI profiler, I got into it real heavily because I, you know, I just loved it. It was something that fascinated me. Well, and then I have I have books on, uh, you know, so many different books on, like, serial killers as well as um, organized crime because, obviously, I'm, like, super into that, too. Like, it's, you know, it's, like, it's super fascinating, but it's the criminal – because, see, unlike a serial killer, you have an organized criminal who's very much a serial killer. You know, like a Carlo Gambino or something, but uh, they're like uh, they're adjusted. You know, like and it's in there's I, I it's just interesting criminology and like the 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 way the brain works and what you know how how people become criminals. But then once I once because I actually even though I actually wanted to be a, like a cop because at a young age like my brain was just like stop the bad guys. At an older age, it turned more into like you know like I, I truly wanted to like help the community and stuff mm -hmm. and. Then I start like learning about like what causes criminal behavior and things like that, and then I realize no cop could ever stop uh, solve crime or stop crime because they nothing about the job title addresses any of the economic issues or the behavioral issues or the mental issues. And then when you have the prison system that's almost designed to make you worse uh, or to make you a recidivist, um, you know, it's just like you're not helping anything. And you, and then this whole we serve and protect a community. And I can go become a Detroit cop right now in the city of Detroit. And um, but I don't have to live there. And Detroit police is filled up with all these suburbanite white boys who do, don't care about black people and they sure as fuck don't care about the city of Detroit. They're just there taking the money, uh, taking the overtime and and like uh, don't don't tell me they care about the fucking community. They don't even they do nothing about it. And uh, you know, it, it, the fact that there's several cities that have these uh, they took got rid of these laws that said you actually had to be a goddamn member of the city if you're going to police it, you know, mm -hmm. be a part of the actual community. And uh, so you got all these people who don't belong. They use Detroit as a start off. You know, they get and in they're and they're they're all they're all racist too. Yeah. Consciously yeah. or unconsciously. Yeah. And uh, crooked as fuck. The amount of Detroit. I worked with so many Detroit cops. Um, 
and uh, like retired and stuff and just every single one of them uh, especially the, the much older ones that I worked with back in like 2009 2010 would just tell stories about bribing hookers getting free blow jobs uh, you know stealing crack money everything and if you I realized if I went into the police because keep in mind I'm like at that time 2009 I, I'm just home from the military of my active duty military I was still in the reserves um, and I'm like a master at arms which is the military cop in the Navy and like and I'm hearing all this shit and I'm thinking to myself if I join the police department and even attempt to be clean or good they're gonna serpico my ass like <laughs> like I'm gonna I'm gonna show up somewhere and they're gonna fucking run away and I'm gonna get machine gunned and uh, you know what I mean like I'm like that's I, a thing of, that's a and serpico was so perfect and that should have done so much to change people's minds about cop but it didn't because you got all this law and order shit and dragnet and whatever all these other horseshit cop shows are that are nothing but copaganda and it's disgusting it's just got people don't people don't want to know about what how the justice system works or whatever and i'm gonna talk about it endlessly and they and they uh, um i have a an ex-girlfriend who became a detroit cop and she'll admit a lot of things to me but then i also kind of see the um sort of like uh uh, it, they promote that us versus them. It's like a cult, and so that's all they think. Nobody's. They think they're going to be killed at any day because they they watch one or two horror shows of some cop getting well, shot somewhere, and they think they think, oh well, that's going to happen to me at any moment, and I better train to k get killed, I, and they I do. No, I I don't even think it's that because I think what it is is it's a <clears throat> it's something that they they latch onto to justify why they should be above the rest of us. <laughs> and, and it feeds into that because they know they know they first of all cops are don't go running into any house cops don't go race we know see what they do about school shooters they go and they hide outside like, yeah they don't go save the kitten the they don't get the cat out of the tree nothing yeah and uh but but they get angry as fuck if they read a story about uh one case like six states away where somebody throws an egg at a cop car some teenage kid and they immediately go say everyone hates us and so it justifies their reason just not even respect you as a person to immediately assume you know it's this weird it's no different than brian kofage's sort of cult where they have this everyone's out to get us circle your wagons and 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 as a response everything's justified uh how we retaliate you know, based yeah. on these like oh, oh, uh, um, narcissistic paranoid delusions exactly and I, I can't tell you how many how many dirty fucking cops went to it because my dad likes to drink and he, he would cook and have barbecues and these guys would come over and shoot the shit and you get a little liquor in them they start telling you what they do uh, to black guys uh, black drug suspects and, I mean I've heard these guys from their own lips Talk about planting evidence and framing somebody for murder. One guy that got away with the murder, they knew he was guilty as fuck, but he got off for a, on a technicality, so they framed him for another one. Well, and, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, um, the way serial killers were able to get away with so much, you know, especially in the 80s and 90s and shit, you know, if the serial killers were targeting whether it was people of the LGBT community or, and currently right now, mm -hmm. well, LGBT community, definitely hookers, because police have always viewed them as just like, not, just not even of sub as subhuman. They don't yeah. even care to like to 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 like investigate them, and they basically allow these serial killers to operate freely. And what we're seeing in a lot of cities right now that uh, people have been bitching about is this: um, uh, it's, it's there's an increase of violence against uh, people who are trans. Uh, especially people who are like trans sex workers and things like that. Right, where right, the cops right. just, oh, freak. Someone beat this freak to death in a motel. Who cares? Ha ha. Who cares? You know, right. It, it's, I, and I've always known about the cops that dragged Jeffrey Dahmer's victim back to him, that 13 year old. Yeah. Um, you know, because I actually, my dad, as a joke, bought me Jeffrey Dahmer's father's book, uh, Father's Story, when I was like 12. Like, yeah. just to mock me. And I ended up reading the thing twice because it is pretty interesting. He's a good guy. And, uh, I actually liked his dad a lot. Well, you know what it is, too? He was a chemist. And so the way a lot of people thought, like, oh, it's weird how he's not as emotionally attached. And he's emotionally detached, introvert, typical kind of like science nerd. And the way he would cope with what was going on is writing down the facts, like just writing down what he knew, trying to process it, trying to understand it. And so it's very... Um, uh, the, the way the book reads is very much like it's almost like um, almost like a police report in a way only through his eyes like 
and which I kind of got. Like I could sympathize with them. Um, but when they came out with that recent show on Netflix, um, Dahmer, it was amazing to see all these people like for the first time hearing about what these cops did and how they yeah. that one of the cops ended up becoming the chief of police in another city. They nothing happened to him. I couldn't watch the it. Fucking child I couldn't thing. watch it. I watched twenty minutes of it and shut it off because just the way that they did. I couldn't. I couldn't watch it because I'm woke now and. Uh, the way that they portrayed the his victims, especially those first uh, couple of gay guys that were in there, it was disgusting. Just to demean them, and turn them into nothing but victims, and to glorify this shit bag. It was just, it was just disgusting. Yeah, I well, couldn't, I couldn't watch there's, it. Yeah, there's no way you can get away from the sensationalism of telling a Dahmer mm -hmm. story. But I will say, and a lot of people will tell you this, that about halfway into that series, it entirely focuses on humanizing the victims, telling their stories. Dahmer's almost not even in a couple episodes as they're going through it. They make a whole point about how there, there was never um, a uh, something erected about the, <clears throat> the victims and everything. So the victims have been getting the shaft. The series makes an attempt at it, but there's no way you can get around it in the entertainment industry of of Dahmer will always be sensationalist material and we we uh, most of us can't look away because it's a fucking train wreck um but yeah yeah like uh but it did definitely that's actually made the show hard to watch uh happening <coughs> when they're focusing on telling you these stories of like the victims of like what kind of people they were and everything and like which really makes you just like your skin crawl because you're just like I don't want to see this guy die like and you what know it's going to happen one of the things that made my skin crawl was this one time uh, this cop it was one of these Sunday barbecue kind of things and this one cop was joking with my dad he said what's the difference between a cop and a lawyer he goes what <clears throat> he says a lawyer can fit, uh, afford a higher class of hookers and I was just like are you talking about my mom fucker my dad thought that was endlessly funny but um uh, but I can't tell you how many times I heard these fuckers talking about having sex with the strippers and stuff. Now they considered it a fringe benefit. They thought it was a fringe benefit that they got to uh, have sex with all the all the uh, strippers well, and stuff. That's, well, that's, that's not. Part they of didn't the get to have sex. That's that's called rape. Rape. Yeah. No. That's that's part of the payoff. See, my friend worked at it as a bouncer at a couple different strip joints. And the way it works is that if you want somebody out of that strip club, like the bouncers can just grab you, beat the shit out of you, throw you out. You call the police. The cops, I'm talking Detroit cops, are there in fucking five minutes. They don't ask any questions. They immediately charge the person you threw out, take them away. You have to pay for that type of police response in some right. way or another, whether it's cash or favors. And, like, nobody understands that. It's like a cop is not going to show up to your fucking house or your fucking business unless you paid into the <coughs> coffer. Like, it pay for, right. it's a pay for place. Yeah, it always has and, been. And here was, here was one of the things, and I wish I could... I wish I could get into it more, but I was talking to this vice reporter, and he did a fantastic expose on Louisville cops. And he was on MSNBC. His name's Roberto Ferdman, and... <clears throat> I was telling him all the information I knew about these barbecues that my dad had, but I was mainly t trying to tell him how to get information out of my dad. So, And he met with my dad several times and talked to him about stuff, but <clears throat> my dad didn't tell him the more uh, juicy stories, I'm sure. I told him as many as I could and where to steer him to, and it was funny because that night, <clears throat> the night before Colfage and Bannon were uh, indicted, I said, listen, Roberto, because I've been talking to him for a couple of months by then, I said, listen, I know you're in this Louisville thing, but you really need to check out this story about this fucker named Brian Colfage. I guarantee you, because I can't remember, it's been like uh, 13 or 14 months since I sent those emails to the uh, Attorney General and the Postal Service. I called the Postal Service. I couldn't get a hold of anybody at the Florida Attorney General's office and speak to them. But... Uh, but uh, that night, I, I I was talking. I was told Roberto, I was like, "You need to do something about this shitbag Brian Colfax because he's a grifting shitbag, and he's I guarantee you he stole all this money from the We Build the Wall thing." <laughs> and so uh, I was dead asleep, and I and I heard Brian Colfax and Steve Bannon were indicted, were arrested today, and I woke up like that, and then I saw I was like, "Holy shit!" 
And I told Roberto, I sent him a message, texted him and said, turn on MSNBC right now. And it's like, Brian Colfage arrested with Steve Bannon or whatever. So I called Jan and told her, me, I was like, can you believe it? And she, I was like so excited. She didn't understand what I was telling her. She hadn't seen the news yet that Brian, Brian had gotten in, indicted or whatever. And I was like, holy shit, they got Steve Bannon along with it. I, I mean, I was like, I didn't expect them to get, get him too. But I mean, of course, they're both grifting shit bags. No, I was. I remember that morning too, because like I worked like a midnight shift. I was probably only asleep for three hours before like the phone calls, like text messages. My dad like like, oh my god, wow, you gotta see this, and uh, and that was also the very first moment I think when my dad realized like how much like 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 what I had been went through, or at least how much I was involved. And because um, I mean you know he'd heard about this. Most of these people don't understand you know the extent of it or. Like almost so, so many people write it off as just internet shit or whatever. But it was that was kind of like the first time I got some fucking acknowledgement. Um, and you know what's funny too is I had looked into how to report this different shit, like um, <clears throat> this original GoFundMe. I think we all tried to report it. Um, and just all this. And, and what I found out is that every time I would type in how to report charity fraud or things <clears throat> like that, most of the sites that would pop up would be like a .au or a .uk or a .eu. Nothing. There's nothing to report. There's no like real agency to report a charity right. fraud, and so it never crossed my mind that it you know it fall under um, both postal and like wire fraud. Uh, the first time I heard the term wire fraud was from Grant Stern. Um, I forget who he writes for. I think you've talked. To Occupy him Democrats. Yeah. 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 And I, when I came to him with like the information I'd gotten from um, the one lady I was speaking to in Florida, who was had looked up um, his, um, um, like she said, there's like a lot of it was city records. Like that's where she saw that he had actually paid off the mortgage, like or at least the land mortgage for his house, all in one lump sum, right at that time for like 200 grand or 175 yeah. grand. And she's like, you can just look it right up in the city. So I was telling Grant Stern what she was saying, how she thinks that he was cycling money back into GoFundMe to up the numbers. And apparently that's considered wire fraud to to fraudulently uh, inflate the numbers of like what you've raised or whatever. And that's, he said, well, that would be considered wire fraud. I'm not sure, like, you know, but yeah, they don't tell you who how to report charity fraud in this country because most charities in this fucking country is fraud. Or is, Here's or is it a form of uh, money laundering? I'll tell you something I'm going to enjoy the fuck out of doing is when he finally reports to prison, which I didn't think he was ever going to go, but boy, that, that he, got, he, got, he, got, he got indicted for that and tax fraud too, so he's going to do yeah, prison. Yeah. But here's the thing they that's going to eat his ass up. Did they those uh, together? The, the state I think of they Florida did. thing was separate, or did they group yeah. it? No, they grouped and, it. They uh, both they they were okay. both in he the both the indictments are in New York City for whatever reason. I don't know why. <clears throat> but the thing that's gonna I'm gonna write I'm gonna have plenty of letters to send Brian while he's in prison. And one of the things yeah. is that if he and here's the thing, he's so fucking stupid. If he just had said that he wasn't gonna take the money, every cent was gonna go towards the wall, if he hadn't have said that he wouldn't have been in any trouble. He wouldn't have been in any trouble at all. There wouldn't have been a fraudulent thing. But because he said, I will take a cent of the money, that's the fraud. And that's just got to eat his ass up. Because he could have said, a small percentage of whatever. He could have taken all he wanted. He could have taken 70% of the money if he wanted to. And it's just like, you, you didn't know how to commit a, you, you're such a, you're good at the grip, but you're not good at the law, you dumb shit. And I'm going to, I'm going to write him pro, <laughs> postcards from Thailand and give him all the shit in the world I can. See, I want to know why, because they did confiscate, like, the Range Rover, the boat. I want to know if they're going to, like, if they're going to, I don't know, do something with the house. But how does... I don't, they can't touch... The, in Florida, they can't touch his house. And I'm surprised they got the asset. I'm surprised they froze the money. I'm guessing that the bank... And that's another stupid thing. Because if he had that money in his own personal account, in a Florida account, I don't think the feds could have taken that either. Because Florida has some screwball bankruptcy laws that protect people that want to... Uh, abscond to Florida and deposit the money there and I know there is for uh, <clears throat> the season property kind of shit is real sketchy uh, I mean you can get away with 
stealing bloody murder and still keep your house in Florida and nobody can attach it. But they got weird bankruptcy laws there. But he was too stupid to do that. And I think they ordered that uh, they well, to, in order to get that whatever bank account they were depositing money who wasn't a bank in Florida, and that's why New York got them. I think it was in well, New wouldn't York. It, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it have been great if uh, they um, repossessed Ashley Kovacs' tits? Like every, I, I don't know if people realize that because it, and a lot of things it says, um, it says uh, cosmetic surgery, but it's her tits. It's his yes, wife's it's her tits. tits. Does, it's her. His, his only fan's wife, and uh, yeah. I guess she likes that kind of attention or whatever. Which I'm sure uh, pre tits that she couldn't have made any money on uh, at Hooters or only fans or whatever she's doing. But uh, well, with again, the tits, this was this was. These, these, this was that couple that back in the day, back when he had his page, Senior Airman Brian Colfage and Freedom Daily, not only would they chastise people about drug use and things like that, but then they would talk about the, you know, the whole family values and all that stuff. And here it's like, okay, you're a pill-popping, pot-smoking uh, uh, vegetable. <laughs> and uh, your and your wife is a whore who fucks guys and does OnlyFans. Like it's just so bizarre. Like, and uh, and then here's my thing. I was I gave this some good thought. Okay, I was thinking about Timothy Shea, his, his yeah. uh, you know criminal uh, partner, and, and his water like, buffalo okay, so, wife. Yeah, do you know why, like, the Irish, like, a lot of Irish people are, like, real racist? You always hear them bitching about the blacks and the this and the that. It's because they don't want anyone to remember that they were actually the worst people to ever come to this country. <laughs> like, the Irish were just morally bankrupt, fucking just, just disgusting, vile people. And, and, uh, and I just thought to myself, what Timothy Shea's defense should have been, it was just, I can't help it. Your Honor, I'm Irish. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm genetically corrupt. I, I just, you know, Louis, you that's, know, you <laughs> and now you know why Louis doesn't have a Facebook uh, account anymore because he says shit like that that is mildly amusing because he's saying it in jest. He's not really that way. You know, because well, it is uh, funny to hear he, he, he's, 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 he's mildly Italian. His last name is Caponecchia. And, well, uh, I won't get into the uh, <clears throat> myriad of epithets that I could toss his way that he thinks are funny, too, but I would. So don't, think, don't take any of that shit seriously. Get woke, Louie. Be woke. Oh yeah, get get woke as you're picking on the Irish. <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny. It's funny because it's like uh, this is okay, just this is people. just it's pen of hostility for these shit bags that Timothy O'Shea just happens to be Irish. It doesn't particularly matter. I mean, if you wanted to give the Irish some valid criticism, it's how much they love paint stripper. Uh, what paint stripper does to their livers. <laughs> <laughs> So the whole reason we can't even buy booze before like noon on Sunday is because the Irish. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, that's actually that's actually pretty true. Actually, yeah, it's they because of the Catholics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the Catholic Church kind of got sick of everybody walking into <laughs> into into Sunday services. Slosh. Yeah, uh, of course, he, nobody, no sane person would want to walk into Catholic church, into church, and sober, I sure as fuck wouldn't. <laughs> you guys, <laughs> you know, it was because most of the parishioners were falling asleep, and they couldn't have that shit. That's why you get free coffee and donuts at all the churches in the South, I can guarantee you that. Flask or <laughs> they, they, they don't like having flask in the Southern Baptist Church much. <laughs> they probably, I mean, the Irish were also washing themselves in the holy water uh, tub there. They have, <laughs> <laughs> they're just bringing out their underwear. Their <laughs> Louis. <laughs> but how, Brian's looking at like uh, five years in uh, the clink. And I don't know where they're going to send him. Probably going to be Danbury, even though he deserves Livingworth. And uh, I don't know about you, but I'm going to make sure to send him postcards from Thailand. I'm going to get an entire oh, yeah, stack because uh, postage is cheap here. And uh, I can just send him off, you know, like one a day, just every single day. I could say, how's prison treating you, Brian? You like that one-inch mat you're sleeping on, buddy? 
do they give you and here's another thing they won't let him have his prosthetics because his prosthetics have my uh uh metal in them all of them do you yeah, can't well, have that he, hide, he can hide paraphernalia in it yeah and uh um, you know and like they could they certain certainly couldn't give him a hook you know that's a dangerous weapon um and let me I'm wondering let me, let me, how let me, like, they're not going to spend seven grand on one of those like robo chairs for him to like you know yeah, sit around like no. so are they going to have to get like some big, <coughs> like, some like big lobbied uh, pedophile to push him around like that you know some people work in the library and then they'll get one that his job is just to you know <laughs> I'm gonna take, take I'm gonna tell you a story that's quite amusing as soon as I get my microphone hooked. Hold on just a second. <clears throat> Somehow, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you the story. I don't know how to exactly tell it because can't violate certain ethics that um, I'm gonna tell you the story real quick about um, a and I won't tell you how I, I know this story <clears throat> but it's a pretty interesting one there was uh, a couple of brothers they were twins and one of them was a <clears throat> architect as it just so happened <laughs> I didn't make that uh, it just happened that he was an architect <clears throat> and the other was a dentist and they were identical twins. And uh, <coughs> uh, one of the, they talked every single day. They were very, very close. And one of the days, uh, his brother didn't show up to work. And he, the dentist didn't show up to work. And his wife ran the dental office. And <coughs> she knew to cancel all the appointments for that day. So the brother, they spoke every single day. So what happened was, is um, uh, he disappeared. Now, before I tell you this, I gotta tell, I gotta tell you this. Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you it in a second. So <clears throat> the architect brother called up Dennis brother and called his house and said, uh, "Where's Michael?" And the wife says, "Probably with one of his whores." And this was rather weird because they told each other everything and he knew that his brother wasn't cheating on his wife or doing anything like that. <clears throat> so he, the, her saying that was really odd. <clears throat> so that didn't happen. So the next day they came and uh, uh, called the brother again and the brother, he didn't answer the phone. And so the architect brother went over to his uh, brother's house, and um, he wasn't there. So he called the police and filed a police, uh, missing persons report. So the police uh, had had a uh, sent over a squad over to ask the a wife where the husband was. He said. And she repeated the line that he was out with another whores or whatever. <clears throat> so they asked if they could search the house, and she wouldn't give him permission, which struck the police uh, kind of odd. So they went and got a uh, search warrant <clears throat> and came through the house, and they went downstairs, and there was a, one of those blue container 55-gallon buckets in the basement. And they sprayed it full of luminol, and there's... You know, though, and uh, they sprayed it with luminol, and there was blood all over this pole or whatever on, on the, this pole support pole that was going up. So uh, they open up the bottle and they find the husband, and uh, he's dead. And she had tortured him to death and uh, cut his uh, slit his throat, apparently, and there was blood all over the place or whatever. <clears throat> Years before this happened, there was a woman out in Bullitt County in, in uh, Kentucky. It was just adjacent to Jefferson County. 
<coughs> and uh, well, let's say the the this one woman was in the alternative pharmaceutical business, shall we say, meth business. And she had a couple of, uh, she lived out on a farm and they were doing their cooks out on this, uh, in the barn. Because it was all, it was an isolated place. They never got caught or whatever. <clears throat> so she got good at making meth or whatever and was, uh, <clears throat> had a couple of associates that after she learned how to make the cooks and everything, she didn't much have use for. So she killed them and fed their bodies to the pigs. It was a pig farm. And, uh, and they so always she say, cut. always be afraid. Always be afraid so, of someone who runs, that has a pig farm. So I, I'll just call this woman. I'll make up her name. I'll call her Cheryl. It was a famous case. I really can't remember her, her, what her real name was. But she, uh, <clears throat> they, Louisville police caught her, uh, or not the Louisville police, Bull County police, and she got sentenced. To, there's only one woman's prison in the state of Kentucky. It's in Pee Wee Valley. And uh, she got caught and convicted and sentenced to <clears throat> a life without parole. She was, it was a, a death penalty case, I think. And, uh, but she was in Pee Wee Valley. She was going to die in prison. She had no possibility of parole. So, uh, <clears throat> as part, uh, she started getting letters from <clears throat> a Christian outreach program, and uh, uh, she was. When you're in jail, if you don't have any family because you killed them or friends, well, you don't get to have any commissary or anything like that, and so you have to work if you want to buy some ramen noodles or Snickers bar, that kind of shit. So part of this Christian outreach program was is that uh, you they would send you a little bit of money every month, okay? And uh, well, come to find out that one of the, this member of the Christian outreach program fell in love with her. I'll call her Cheryl. And they was set you know, they was going to fall in love, and if she, they was going to try to get married at, at the jail and stuff. This went on for uh, about 12 months. So, uh, <clears throat> meanwhile, the wife uh, of the dentist gets tried, and they're going to have a big, and it was a big media case, too. It was a big trial and everything. And uh, she gets sentenced to life, or she gets, she gets life. She got life, which in Kentucky I think is 13 years. She didn't get, she didn't get the life without parole or anything because she had no prior felonies or anything like that. <laughs> so she, they cart her off, and it, the way that Pee Wee Valley Prison is set up is it's just a gigantic dormitory. So there's no different sections for violent offenders. They're all the same. So if you're in there for drunk driving, you're right there next to the women convicted of capital murder. Uh, so. Uh, this Christian outreach program <clears throat> is sending money to Cheryl, who is the one that fed her, her co-defendants or the dead guys to the pigs. She gets a letter one day from this Christian outreach program. And just think about how I know this, and that'll give you some gravitas to what I'm about to say. So the Christian outpost uh, person said, informed Cheryl that uh, he was sorry, but he was going to have to break up with her because he had met somebody else who was actually going to get to get out of jail, and that she was no longer, and that he wasn't allowed to send her money anymore because it would be wrong and unethical for him to send money to a woman that he found in. Uh, that's in prison there. And when she gets out, she's gonna get, uh, they're gonna get married. So uh, Cheryl finds out uh, who this person was, and it's the dentist's wife. Mm -hmm. So Cheryl finds the dentist's wife, and um, she gets her in the uh, uh, shower and takes a curling iron and uh, used it to cauterize her colon, shall we say. 
and was so violent <coughs> it was so violent that she ended up in a wheelchair with a colostomy bag and uh, so when somebody's in prison the moral of this story is is uh, when you're in prison you would be amazed what somebody would do for a fucking Snickers bar I kind of you know, want to tell I Brian that uh, story yeah, well, I, I think I think somebody I think somebody watching right now knows that I've talked about that before. I mean, you could just send a letter to anyone, right? You can send a letter to anyone. Oh, here's another thing. The in Kentucky, you're allowed to have four four bank transactions a month. Um total so every month the dentist's wife she got uh, four checks for four postal money orders for one dollar each every month so the most money she could ever have every month was four dollars a month dollars <laughs> and I'm sure she's still alive she's still getting that four dollars a month I can guarantee you that Mm -hmm. See, I'd like to know too. Um, um, wh whatever prison he goes to, will there be an Aryan Brotherhood, and how long before he, um, <laughs> you know, all, all, all I, I don't know about the Danbury ones, but I know all state prisons are set are uh, follow racial lines, and I'm pretty sure most of the federal prisons do too. So. Uh, and he'll probably get some kind of special status and get something like Danbury, Connecticut, which is a country club, L almost literally. I know they got tennis courts there and some other shit. So I would imagine well, not, he'd get that, that's not that's him, no good. <laughs> Unless you know, <laughs> gonna, go, gonna go on the tennis court. Like. <laughs> <laughs> Lou, your picture froze on my end. Let's see if that. Let's see. Hold on. Are you moving around on your screen? Let me see. Yeah. Okay, because you're frozen on my screen. Let me see. Uh, yours, yours did that earlier. It just kind of like started working again. Um, uh, well, I, I, I'm, I'm afraid to exit out because I don't know if I can, if I'll know how to get it back up. I just hit you on it. Uh, that's not good. Uh, that I just got rid of you uh, somehow. Hold on, I can turn the video off and turn it back on and see if that works. Okay, try that. Try that. Okay. Yeah. Now turn it back on. Okay, there we go. Oh, I just that worked. Yeah. Now how did I turn? Now how did I do the picture in picture thing before? <laughs> I don't remember how I did it. Uh, wait, 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 wait. I I don't have you in my picture in picture now. Let's see. Guess. No. Uh, I'm still, what I'm seeing, I'm still up in the top right. Right. Well, all right. Well, we've been going on. This is almost two hours, Louie. I think we should probably yeah. give anybody a break and continue maybe some other day. But we'll enjoy the day. Uh, seize the day, you all. Carpe diem. Uh, just like Louie and I did. And Brian, I hope all of the stress and pressure of knowing you're going to end up in prison is absolutely fucking terrible. I hope it's just well, uh, wearing on your mind. And that, and of course, Ashley is going to divorce you. Yeah, she's not going to wait. No, that's not going to happen, Brian. Sorry. Uh, she's not going to wait for you, a ballless gimp uh, who doesn't know how to pleasure her, <laughs> a woman. Uh, yeah, she's not going to wait for you, Brian. Sorry, not not sorry yeah sorry sorry See, not I, sorry I, Brian. and i i'd like to know what happens to his um military benefits oh, wait, Louis. if you get charged with a felony what, what happened hold on what you let me look and see sound output oh i did that shit again okay okay i can hear you now louis okay yeah no i was just saying like i i mean what i was taught in the military as a master at arms and I remember having to tell this to Brian uh, if you're 
because they would talk to us about jurors like what our jurisdiction was we have authority over if you're a military retiree uh, if you're collecting any kind of benefits from the military, you are still subject to the UCMJ, and there's also the Joint Ethics Regulations, um, which is a completely different thing uh, that deals with like you know the actual ethics of both retiree to duty members. And technically, the military can retry him for the same exact crimes because he's collecting benefits. At I do know time, that. Though, I, I do know, know that. Yeah, yeah, and and they, who chances are they probably wouldn't? Who knows? But he sh he should definitely lose those benefits. You don't get those anymore. If you get, um, they even have. Well, uh, they even we'll have, have to make sure that similar rules. We'll, we'll have to do that. Well, yeah. we'll have to make sure that. Yeah, I, that, I, I want. I want an answer because like the, none of these journalists have bothered asking that, and I don't want to see more fucking favoritism by the the military. Uh, you know, looking the other way like they have for so many years. Um, uh, but they even had similar rules for people who collected pensions from different unions. If you got charged with like uh, a certain class of felony, um, that um, you can lose your pension. Even you get, you know, you basically booted out of the fucking union, even as a retiree. Uh, I don't know if that still exists for certain unions today or not, but that that was a pretty standard thing. And but definitely for the military, you were not supposed to continue collecting benefits uh, if you've been charged with like a felony. Well, we'll have to make sure that uh, uh, Bureau of Prisons uh, make sure that Brian's not getting his benefits because uh, he certainly doesn't deserve them. And I'm going to rather enjoy him going through the detoxes that are so rude because you're not allowed to get narcotics in Federal Bureau of Prisons that I'm aware of. So, uh, fuck him. Well, unless you pay. <laughs> No, the federal prisons. The federal prisons are pretty good. It's hard to find the the. Uh, it's hard to find the corrupt guards there because those guys make decent money. Unlike some of the state prisons, where they'll bring in a oh, phone yeah, yeah. and uh, do whatever they can to uh, help you get contraband in. Yeah, fun, funny, uh, just side note before we quit, uh, they a lot of prisons started adopting a um, visitation thing that would be via Skype. They wouldn't even allow family members to come visit, and the family members would have to pay something like $15 like a minute or something. To oh, I know, it's ridiculous. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah they yeah. have that, too. And, and it's and like, the, it's the like whole, three bucks a minute. Yeah. It's like three bucks a minute. Yeah, and the whole... And the whole purpose behind it was that a lot of these different prisons would resort to this. And keep in mind, who they're char they're overcharging. They're just they're just ta they're gouging the family members of people or of inmates. And uh, the whole reasoning behind it was to uh, stop and limit you know contraband paraphernalia coming in, because they're they're basically saying it's the family members. Well, guess what? Not a it didn't the contraband and paraphernalia didn't get uh, uh, didn't go down one fucking percent when they instituted <laughs> yeah. this. And, and they never they never will either. They never will. Yeah, because it's the guards. It's always the guards. Yeah, it's Everybody always the like, fucking guard. Yeah, and they know which ones to get to. There, yeah, that's another big scam that goes on in our justice system. It's just our justice system is a fucking nightmare on so many levels. And I'm going to uh, keep making videos about that shit, too. And if people watch, great. If not, I, well, I don't care. I need to, I've got a lot of pent-up hostility I need to unleash and get out of me. Well, here's something interesting. I Because I, I asked this question in the past, just, just out of, like, because of my interest in criminology and shit. Like, I thought to myself, how dangerous are some of these, like, sex offenders, like these, like, CP people or these people that are, like, attempt to meet somebody underage online, et cetera, et cetera. Because, you know, everyone wants to kill them and everything. And I'm like, okay, well, once they get processed into the system, what is their rate of recidivism? And you wonder what's amazing? They have the lowest recidivism rate. Yeah, and, they do. Uh, Th there, was a, there, was a, low. there was an article put out the, uh, a couple of weeks ago. I think I shared it on my profile too, and it and it was a study that uh, of people that they let out of prison during COVID, and how many of them uh, reoffended, and there was like one one person out of twenty five thousand. I couldn't believe it. I was just like, yeah, that's the kind of data that the cops don't want out, or Republicans for that matter. 
Well, and I and I got to thinking because they were talking about how people who committed like armed robberies, things like that, were like forty percent more likely, with, and they would do it by within the first five, first ten, like first three, mm-hmm. first five, first ten years that they're out. And like people who commit like armed robbery or different types of those types of crimes, it was like forty percent chance that they would be they would they would commit the same crime or similar crime within the first three years, whereas like like uh, these like kitty diddlers or these wannabe diddlers or what attempted diddlers it would be like one to three percent in like the first three to five years but then it's like uh, I'm, I'm tr- and you can never really ask that question because it sounds like it's, it's when you look into criminology and the sociology you 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 can't people are going to think that you're sympathizing with the criminal when but i want to find out like how do you make this fucking shit stop and can we figure out what's causing it to begin with you know because nobody asks those questions and then I realized maybe the reason why the recidivism rate is so low is because of all the crimes that are committed, they're the ones who tend to get uh, uh, like court ordered uh, therapy and uh, and uh, and they're also like kind of like watched more locally, like they're not just fucking right. tossed into the street and forgotten about. Um, so there's all kinds of programs and shit like that that they extend to sex offenders that results in lower recidivism rates that they do not extend to fucking, uh, uh, you know, people commit armed robbery, carjacking, all these other, all these other crimes. When I was in jail in Louisville, the, the kitty, there was a famous one there. There was a, a case of this guy that he was, uh, I think he was schizophrenic. Don't know, don't care, but he had killed a little two, uh, three-year-old girl and uh, raped her or whatever. And I'm not kidding you, Louis. This is, this is, I'll never forget this. Uh, this, uh, this, the, the, the protective custody guys wear red uniforms in jail. And when this motherfucker came out, I'm not going to, I'm not kidding you. The trustees, the trustees are like the, you know, the most well behaved, uh, and they have to be there for like six months or whatever, or, or longer. I can't remember what it is to get a trustee status. It was some impossibly difficult thing to get. And, uh, this guy, this guy that had killed this little girl, he came out and the two guards were escorting him. He had to be everywhere he went, he went to escort, and he got right in front of our, our dormitory. And the guards stopped and he kept walking. And as soon as he kept walking, the trustees swarmed this guy and they were beat, and the guards just sat there. I mean, these trustees were beating the living fuck out. They were trying to kill him. They were trying to kill him. One guy had a mop handle. And he was like, you know, hitting him in the face with it or whatever. The guy's just bleeding profusely, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, they had to. They had a K. They had these. They used to have this uh, thing that went down to the floor below us, and they put a screen over that because apparently a couple of guys had committed suicide or some shit. So I mean, they beat the living fuck out of this guy. And the guards just sat there and watched it. Didn't do a thing. They didn't hit the call buttons, nothing. They just sat there. And, I mean, these four guys just beat and beat and beat. This guy was, you know, just blood coming out of all of his orifices. It was fucking beautiful. Nobody felt a lick of somebody for him or whatever. So, they eventually, they call an ambulance and they take him out on a fucking stretcher. And uh, the trustees had to go to uh, isolation, okay? And they didn't lose their jobs. That was a funny thing. So when that happened, everybody did a uh, uh, a commissary bag for them. So you were at you went, hey, you want to donate to the guys or whatever? I'm not kidding you. We filled up an entire seventy dollar sack full of commissary shit for those guys. That's how much. I, and and that was it was kind of an endearing because it's like the the inmates you know believed in justice more than the fucking prosecutors yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, there's a keen yeah, sense of fraternity. Yeah, they're not. They're not gonna. They're not gonna be nice to those fuckwads. I can guarantee you that. And I hope well, Brian yeah, gets it too. Because... I hope I, Brian's gonna try to sell all that shit. Like I was just a victim. I shouldn't. Have, that shit. That's gonna catch him a beating too. You know, all that right wing bullshit. They don't want to hear it. Nobody wants to put up with an well, insufferable can... ass like him. Yeah, he can get mouthy. Here's the thing I do know about him talking to uh, his former people who had served with him in the Air Force and shit. He was from uh, boot camp on up, was a notorious rat. He would, uh, they said he was just like a, he was basically like a throw temper tantrums. Um, 
you know, he always had like this, I'm above you type thing. And then mm -hmm. if somebody did something that he didn't like or whatever, he was constantly telling on people all the time, just writing people out. And he was like known as a rat that you couldn't trust. This is why, can you name me one person who served with Brian Clifage who's been by his side from beginning to end? And there never will be. There's, there never there are will none. be. There are none. There are none. There, he's got no, no shipmates, or at least that we call them shipmates in the Navy. Yeah. My shipmates. Nobody's got his back. Brian was, yeah. Yeah. When mm. Brian was attacking my military record, my shipmates were there on Facebook saying, "I served with them. Fuck you." So this guy, he, he's never had anyone who served with them has never spoken about him, come to his defense. Uh, 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 he's the, he's the kind of guy. He he's the kind of guy that would have gotten fragged at any kind of combat situation. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, people but, would have been like, right. "Yeah, that guy needs to go." Yeah, that guy needs to go. Or the old uh, the, the soap, <laughs> soap in a pillowcase. So. Well, let's get off All here, right. Louie. I, I haven't eaten yet, and I'm going to go eat, and I got to feed Lily, and uh, you know, take care in other ways. So. <clears throat> we might do this again. We might do this again uh, tomorrow or whenever. I don't know. But you need to get better yeah, lighting. My, you need to get some better lighting. My schedule and shave. My, uh, more Adderall. My schedule. My schedule is supposed to uh, normalize in another week. Um, and uh, and I would like to find some way where we can actually play media somehow because. Uh, that clip when I show that clip to people, the one of you just oh I oh wait wait, wait 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 just a minute wait 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 just a minute I it, I I can do that I know how to do that I just have to download those files oh, really? first yeah I, I've got a button uh, right here I know how, I know it'll work that I can just pick it up and and hit it and uh, it'll play let me hold on, hold on. Let, me, let, let me let me hold on in fact. In fact, let me let me do this one Billy Connolly one. I love this. Let me see if it, if it, if I can get this. Fuck off! It's such a lovely pair of words, and it's international. I don't care where you are. If somebody's fucking with your bags at Lassai Airport in Tibet, and he's got a shaven head and and saffron clothes on, and you say, "Hey, fuck off!" He knows exactly what you mean. Exact, he will fuck off. Off he will fuck. Fuck off doesn't mean go away. Fuck off means fuck off. And everybody feels what it means. Nobody can write it down. There is no English equivalent for fuck off. Because it is English, fuck off. You know? And English expressions don't have English equivalents. They fucking are. You know? <laughs> back to here okay yeah so i know how to do it i just had to download okay. those files and i didn't do it so and i'm uh well I've, we've been doing this for a couple hours and i'm not used to being erect for this long <laughs> uh, i'm gonna go get some food and take care of lily because it's like what, what time is it it's almost three o'clock here and we only eat once a day so i gotta go feed her you, what are you like 12 hours ahead or 24 it's uh 249 right now yeah it's 249 a.m yeah 12 hours exactly. it's sunday it's still sunday yeah, for you yeah, yeah. okay yes yeah, so you're 12 okay all right Louis. magical all right we'll we'll see y'all tomorrow fam and or i'll see you tomorrow i don't know when me and louie will be back on if you want to see me more of me and Louie, we can uh, maybe do that. You need to get some better lighting and a better backdrop, and you need to shave. And uh, that shirt is fucking hideous. You well, it's, especially it's need a backdrop. That well, it's hideous. I don't care. But, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> and your paneling is, I mean, out of some kind of '70s horror show. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, it is dated. <laughs> Is it? I hadn't noticed hardly. It's a bit. It's a bit dated. It looks like a, you know one of those Friday Thirteenth and Freddy Krueger kind of uh, situations there. Meanwhile, I'm off in the middle of space. You know that's because people like this. Get you a 4K background and a green screen or something. I'm glad I can't hear you doing that. 
Oh, your I thought that was your kazoo, not the not your no, vape. No, <clears throat> no. I hope that vape isn't isn't isn't, isn't uh, some California bud. No, I don't. I don't touch weed. Never touched. It. <laughs> I I had it in California, and I mean, I just I can't handle it. I don't like it. It makes me too. Fu it fucks me up. I don't like being uh, cuckoo yeah, for too. cocoa puffs on myself. I like having control of my mental faculties. I can't. I can't handle that shit. I, I can. I can think and control. My, I can think and control myself better on acid than I can with like weed. I've never done acid. <laughs> no, it's I've great. Done, is it? Well, I don't want oh, yeah. to know. I don't want to find out. All right, Luis. Talk to y'all later. See you later, fam. Uh.